I think when we look where we sit in history, the things we have to deal with, like climate change, available clean drinking water, will require us to do the impossible. And I encourage leaders in the, these leader seminars that I speak in and disaster preparedness seminars, is that we need to create a list of impossible. Because there you will find the things that will drive the future economy and our survival as a country and as a, a global people. We stand today. The Business Method. The business with method. a shadow. The Business Method. The Business Method Podcast. The Business Method Podcast featuring Chris Reynolds. Entrepreneurs, systems, methods, tools, and tactics for location independence. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm your host, Chris Reynolds, and welcome to the Business Method Podcast, a podcast featuring successful entrepreneurs and high-profile people dissecting their business models. We dissect the different methods, tools, and tactics of high-performance online entrepreneurs and high-caliber people in a series format. On our first series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs in 100 days that have built businesses creating $100,000 or more annually. On our second series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs that have built location-independent businesses that produce over a million dollars in annual revenue. And now we're interviewing 100 major influencers to get behind the minds and the science of using influence to grow business and influence income results, economies, and cultures. There's a growing number of people building these caliber of businesses like this, and we're going to figure out what it takes to make this happen now let's jump in today's show the business method hey listeners welcome to the show today i've got a special guest for you and by chance i was speaking to an old friend and i had been looking for some high-ranking military professionals to come on the show for some time and i'm excited to introduce today's guest his name is lieutenant general honore and he's a retired lieutenant general who served as a 33rd commanding general of the u.s first Army at Fort Gilliam, Georgia. He is best known for serving as commander of Joint Task Force Katrina Gulf Coast and as the 2nd Infantry's Division Commander while stationed in South Korea. Prior to his command of Joint Task Force Katrina, leading the Department of Defense response to Hurricane Katrina and Rita in Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, General Honore served in a variety of command and staff positions which focused on defense support to civil authorities and homeland defense. For four of the past six hurricane seasons, General Honore has supported the Department of Defense planning and response for Hurricanes Floyd in 1999, Lily and Isidore in 2002, Isabel in 2003, and Charlie, Francis, Ivan, and Jean in 2004. General Honore also planned and supported the United States military response to the devastating flooding which swept Venezuela in 1999 and Mozambique in 2000. As Vice Director for Operations, he led the Defense Department's planning and preparation for the anticipated Y2K millennium abnormally. He planned and oversaw the military response to the Space Shuttle Columbia tragedy and the DC sniper shootings. His list of medals and awards are literally too many to mention, but they will easily fill up a page. Now, today on the show, we dive into the general story over the past 40 years and how he handles disastrous situations, decision making, and clear thinking. He talks about how to stay calm in these types of situations, what leadership as a general has taught him over the past 40 years, and uh, how he got started. He actually started out attending segregated schools in rural Louisiana with a dozen siblings to become the man that handled disasters and hurricane damage relief all over the world. You guys, it's an, another exciting episode, and I hope you really enjoy this one. Ladies and gentlemen, General Honoré. Entrepreneurs, systems, methods, tools, and tactics. Listeners, welcome to the podcast today. I am very excited to introduce our guest. Uh, for a while now, we've been interviewing people that have a significant amount of influence on business, culture, economies, and these these guests have been really incredible people that share their insights and their experience with us to uh, let us know about things of leadership and and um, influence and how they use that in a responsible way. I've been wanting to get uh, someone from the military on the show 
uh, since we started this series. And today's guest is a Lieutenant General who's joining us. His name is Lieutenant General Honoré and uh, hails from the great state of Louisiana and has accolades uh, that back up for 37 years with the military and introduction. I'm sure you heard some of those, but they're really impressive. And uh, I want to welcome General Honoré on the show. How are you doing, General? I'm doing great, Chris. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming on, and I really appreciate it. Um, now, our guests always are curious how we get connected with, excuse me, our listeners are always curious how we get connected with our guests. And by chance, a really good friend of mine, um, Paul Ruder, who happened to be at a conference you were speaking at, just went up to you and said, hey, I've got a friend that has a podcast. I think it'd be a win-win if you guys uh, get together and and create a show. And, and so is as simple as that. And then, um, I was introduced to your assistants and it's great to have you here. So thank you so much for your time. And I know, uh, there's a hurricane that just wrapped up in the U S and one of your jobs are used to be really to kind of be on top of the hurricanes and severe weather, but thanks for, for taking your time. And are you at back home in Louisiana today? Yes, sir. I am. I am in Louisiana contemplating, uh, um, uh, to go down to the Bahamas to help them uh, in the uh, recovery yeah. phase. So it's it's always something going on. Now, uh, I know you were uh, in charge of hurricanes and and the, the aftermath of hurricanes for many years. Uh, how long have you been doing that? Well, my last four years in the Army, when I came in, the first Army was a principal uh, mission for First Army. I was the 33rd commander of First Army in Atlanta, responsible for providing military support to civil authorities east of the Mississippi River, as well as for training National Guard and Reserve troops uh, for Iraq and Afghanistan and Africa and Gitmo. So, uh, daytime job, train troops. Uh, Part-time job, when storms come, be prepared to provide military assistance to the states as requested by the governors. Got it. And I'm, I'm curious how you got into that field because, um, uh, but uh, I think we'll talk about it later on in the show, but I want the listeners to get to know you a bit better. I was reading about you, grew up in the swamps, of Louisiana in a shack with, I think, did you have five brothers and three sisters or something like that? No, it was 12 of us. 12. Uh, yeah. Nine boys and three girls. I was number eight boys straight. What was it like growing up in Louisiana then? It was hot. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember that. It was hot. And uh, we grew up in a typical old uh, wood frame house without air conditioning. Uh, I remind people, you know, when I was young, we didn't, air conditioning hadn't been invented yet for normal people. <laughs> yeah. And hardly anybody in our area had air conditioning when I was a child. But we grew up on a subsistence farm. We raised cotton, corn, pigs, chicken, uh, and sugar cane uh, for, was our cash crops and everything else we ate. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I'm curious, like I, a lot of people, it seems like from the military, they get a good foundation from, from their childhood and uh, from, their, from their parents. What was it like for you growing up? Did you have a good home and good parents? Oh, yeah. They were hardworking people uh, that uh, they weren't well-educated, but they were smart. Yeah. Uh, to raise 12 children successfully uh, and not one of them having any trouble with the law. Uh, that was uh, remarkable. And most of my brothers and sisters went into the brothers went into the trades. They were carpenters, electricians, and uh, bricklayer, and uh, they did well. And uh, I was the first to go to college, uh, but it started at the home. You know, uh, when you got that many people to feed, everybody would have to participate. And uh, there's literally a thing on a subsistence farm: you eat what you kill. Right. <laughs> you know, and that, that word, when I first heard it in the business world, you know, meaning you get back what you go harvest, uh, nobody had to explain that to me because that's how it was growing up on a small farm. 
uh, and you had to learn how to get along with people, with 12 people, uh, brothers and sisters. And uh, by the time I got in high school, the older brothers and sisters had moved on. So we weren't literally 12 in the house with parents at one time. So uh, that was a big help. And I went to public school. I went to segregated public school. Oh, yeah. And they spent a lot of time with us, with uh, programs. Like the 4-H club was very instrumental in getting me uh, interested in the concept of leadership. And then when I got in high school, I was in an organization called the New Farmers of America. Uh, and by my senior year in 1966, uh, the New Farmers of America, which were primarily for uh, people, uh, African-American students, uh, they integrated with the New Farmers of America, which are Future Farmers of America, which many people around the country are familiar with. But again, there was a heavy emphasis on leadership in the Future Farmers of America, and we go to a national convention, and it almost looked like a big political convention. People running for national president. So you saw how the process work of uh, being able to give a good speech, to influence people with your words and demeanor yeah. and how you carry yourself. So all those little snippets along the way in coaching uh, from the county agents to teachers, I think contributed to the point when they got to college and they came in the Army. Now, I'm, I'm curious about your experience in Louisiana back then and, and going to segregated schools. Um, how, how do you feel that affected you as a young child? I think the biggest impact, we had good teachers. Yeah. Uh, it was somewhat disheartening to see we used, we had used books. We seldom got new books uh, and they would pass them down from the majority of schools. And the other thing is the time. There was a high school uh, a half a mile from my house, uh, which I could walk to if I was allowed to go there, but we caught a bus at 6.15 or 6.20 in the morning and didn't get back until 4.30 in the afternoon. Mm. That's a lot of time yeah, on the is. bus for four years. But at the time, it looked like an opportunity because – I couldn't really complain to my dad because when he grew up, there were no high schools for people of color in my parish. And the people that did go, some of the veterans from World War II, went back to high school, they had to go to high school in Baton Rouge, which is about 25 miles away. It meant they had to go stay with relatives. So it was a significant leap from one generation to the next, but you know, we kind of take it in stride. and. I think that bit of, uh, of uh, if you would call it a challenge or adversity, uh, in a way might have made me a little bit stronger to be able to accept stuff you can't change yeah. and move on and get it done. And, and in the business world, in the grown-up world, uh, you have to be able to accept things that they are and change them if you can. Right. When, when did you decide you wanted to be a military man? Well, that was kind of decided for me. Okay. <laughs> that's not what was going on. Uh -huh. And when I got to college, you know, you either went to college or went, went to war. I went to college and I had to join the ROTC program, Reserve Officers Training Program. And that was mandatory the first two years. And then if you stayed on, you they would allow you to finish college and not draft you because then you would go in the army as a second lieutenant. And that's the path I took. I wanted to be an officer. I wanted to do something two of my cousins had done. Matter of fact, at that same university I graduated. And by the time I went to college, one was a major and the other one was a lieutenant colonel. And that was what was an inspiration to me. And going to college and then working through while in college, that was a challenge. But again, all that I think uh, was in my built character. I was told one time by one of my leaders, uh, the only difference between charcoal and diamonds is heat and pressure. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> right. Uh, I had learned that along the way in more ways than one. 
And I think it, uh, in, in a way, it uh, it helped me compensate from for some of the other for my weaknesses, if I may use that word, the things that I will not get at uh, those uh, that those challenges and experiences uh, helped me work through stuff that w- would more likely have been a big challenge to me. Now, out of all the all the siblings, were you the only one to go to college? Yes, uh, I had a couple, uh, two of my sisters started, but uh, I was the only one to graduate. Okay. Um, and you spent 37 years in the military. It was incredibly impressive, and thank you for your service. Um, that type of career, I, I imagine the lessons that you learn and experience that you have uh, is just mind-blowing. And I'm sure you could talk for weeks and weeks and weeks about you know what you've learned and the stories that you've gained but could you could you give us a, 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 a you know few minute introduction on your career um, from the start to the the to when you retired as an army officer yeah I mean you know uh, coming into the army is uh was a real life changer for me going off to Fort Benning, Georgia. I was in the infantry and been an infantry officer uh, school at Fort Benning uh, as a second lieutenant. And I went to Airborne School and uh, you're always humble in the Army. <laughs> we would start a class and, and uh, you thought you were big stuff sitting there with your second lieutenant bar or and the uh, tactical officer would say, let's look at this day in history and the Korean War <laughs> when General MacArthur landed at Incheon. Yeah. I mean, there were always giants, you know, uh, like MacArthur or Patton or Joe Pershing or Lee or Grant. I mean, the place was just full of superstars, people who had done extraordinary things by influencing others. And all the great ones, you would see great pictures of them, you know, through recorded history. When we got a recorded history as we had Napoleon, I mean, and it was such an inspiration uh, to have that level of influence. So if you if you read a little bit, and they would back then teach us that you know, a, a part of being a good officer is being a lifetime learner. And when you have nothing, you think you have nothing to do, read some history. And uh, boy, there were a lot of lessons that came from that. <laughs> Those learning years and through the years, a positive lessons about just basic things like, Napoleon's number one rule uh, for warfare, you got to get there. <laughs> it's a good starting point. Right? <laughs> you got to get there. I mean, <laughs> uh, and many times getting there is the hardest part. And uh, he would use a corporal and the master of the art of war uh, had much to do with his ability to maneuver his formation. Now, he didn't do too good when he went into Leningrad, but he had a great plan. <laughs> the weather got it. But just about any other place he went was very deliberate, and in most cases, he outmaneuvered his enemy and defeated them uh, because of his movements. And there's an old saying, well, Nepo- who's going to be my Napoleon's corporal? And he would make a movement plan out. He'd, set it on the table and said, you know, bring the corporal in here. And the corporal will look at how far they were going to march, how many mountains they were going to go over and said, what do you think? You think we can do this in four days? And the corporal who was accustomed to wearing that 60 or 70 pound pack on his back and walking would give him an estimate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the story of Napoleon's corporal because he could not see it through the corporal's eye. And, how many lectures have you gone to or uh, books that's been read, written about having that ability to uh, use the 
collective wisdom around you, uh, people who uh, can add value from the experience and those that can add value from being able to see the unknown, you know, or figure it out. And uh, that that was always uh, something that could inspire you in your darkest hour when things were going bad. Uh, and talking about leadership, and, and I'm often asked, you know, what do you, you know, what's the leadership? I said, well, on the good days is the art and the science of influencing others to accomplish your mission, uh, because. Uh, the tough thing about leadership is getting people to do what they don't want to do. Yeah. <laughs> For your <laughs> and, reasons too. <laughs> right. And, uh, and people, cause people don't like change and, but we all know if you're not changing, you're falling behind. So th those collective things from reading much history and having my own share of failures, uh, have sort of inoculated me to uh, just because you give an order, it don't mean it's going to be carried out. On that topic of um, getting through your failures, when over your 37 year career, when was your, your most difficult time and what are some of the things that helped you get through that? Yeah, I think they could be defined probably to, uh, the most difficult one was dealing with Katrina because it was so complex. It was in the news. Right. But I'd like to split that. There was one that was most emotional to me. And it came from an accident we had in South Korea my last month in command, which had been a very successful almost two years in command along the demilitarized zone. South Korea was commanded second infantry division. About 17,000 troops uh, along the demilitarized zone. In uh, that last, I'd say maybe a month in command, we would on a, doing a major maneuver. And, you know, South Korea is very highly populated, heavily populated. And that, the roads are kind of narrow. We knew that. We worked through that. We would do all we can to avoid accidents. And on that particular morning, one of our, armored personnel carriers was driving around the road and didn't see two 12 year old girls and then killed them, rolled over. Them. And that was the most emotional failure uh, in my command, because I think there's, there's things that, that happen to you that self-inflicted sometimes. And I'll talk to that a little bit when we talk about Katrina, but this was something that was, why, you know, it make you question, you know, you believe in God, you, you know, you do all your right stuff and say, how did this happen? Two 12 year old girls, how did he let that happen? And when you go back and, you know, all the investigations are done and uh, protests in South Korea with the deaths of these girls to a point where they tried to, it would bring waves of people out, students, because in South Korea, you, it's a great country. I love going there. But a part of their culture is they, they, they manage their democracy through their ability to protest and it helped change and shape that country to what it is today. And uh, there's a rite of passage as a middle school and high school student to go out and protest. So about four o'clock, here come the middle school student. Then about six o'clock, here come the college students. And then in the evening, all the people that worked all day, they show up. And I mean, they would come up in the thousands protests the death of these two young girls and uh, the process was exacerbated by we were using U.S. law to deal with the soldiers that was driving the vehicles which means taking account it wasn't an accident taking account that we don't think it was any criminal intent but in the Korean culture and this way you get down to culture and law is that if you kill someone in an accident, then you automatically go to jail. And they did not understand why those troops were not in jail. And they wanted to put them in Korean jail, which was prohibited by the status of forces agreement. So not to belabor the point, it was complex. 
the president had to deal with it. He from the White House had to make statements on it. The New York ambassador in South Korea, it made the national news here. And then these two soldiers who volunteered to come in the army, part of that one percent, out doing their duty. They just did not see the little girls. And we did memorial services. We did everything we could. And uh, this remained even today in South Korea, a hot button issue. Uh, when we talk about uh, the presence of the American soldiers there. And then the, the push for justice. And again, that was an emotional ride that I'll never forget. And it, it make you question your competence at higher command. But I had to remember, again, history snaps you back in the face that the reason we were there was because about 60 years earlier, there was a war there. And many people died. Some of them died from uh, artillery, friendly artillery. Some of them died from friendly air strike and many died at the hands of the enemy that we had to put this in perspective and many died because of the cold bitter weather and the only reason these two sergeants were in korea was there to help protect the uh, south korean people from north korea and, and communist china uh invasion and we had to go back to our gut and and, and get a check on ourselves because at the time it was a very emotional almost life-changing event for me i could imagine when you're when going through that that time what are some of the things that you thought about that could keep you going and i know you've had decades of experience with uh turmoil and and chaos uh but personally like when in your own personal thoughts when you're alone uh what do you what do you think about or draw upon during those times to say, okay, uh, I've still got to get up and go, and mm -hmm. these, these are the this is the plan I'm going to make, the steps I'm going to take. Is I think that fair sense of and knowledge of history, and to look at some of the major failures in warfare because of decisions of leaders, and then to put in perspective. The difference between warfare today and where we operate as a military is that the people who made the big news in World War II were the generals, you might say. Mm -hmm. Today, decisions of a, a private or a sergeant or a second lieutenant, because of the media and the exposure, could have a strategic implication, as it did in South Korea. Uh, and that was the actions of soldiers just doing what they thought was expected them moving that armored vehicle, uh, having been out there in the heat and rain for days. Uh, and then this happened. They kind of put things in perspective that you have to put it in perspective and, and move on. And uh, time has a way of dealing with these, but I also knew I had to make a emotional collection, connection to the parents. I think that, and we made arrangements and I went out, I'll never forget a few days before I left South Korea and went into their homes, took my boots off at the door and they were poor farmers, the two sets of parents. And I knew life was gonna be okay when they, cut a fresh watermelon and we sat down and kind of moaned in a state of mourning through an interpreter telling them how sorry I was for the loss of their daughters. And it, it was uh, an experience, but I think we left a legacy. We came, I came up with a plan and it was executed. Once I left, we built a monument to those two little girls. And I remember when we asked the South Korean government for the land, they said, yeah, it's going to cost you some money. So we had to pay for that land from the South Korean government, transportation department, to put that monument up. And again, those emotional things hit you. You would think they would 
have just openly donated, but we had to pay for it. We had to buy it. We bought the land and we collected money from the troops in South Korea. They all donated so we could build that monument. And the monument was constructed after I left, but it's, it's there today and as a tribute to those two young girls. Yeah. Now, you mentioned General also one of the hardest times was Katrina. And um, I'm, I'm curious, your role, I, I got some information about your role in it, but just so I'm clear exactly, your role in Katrina, were you, were you the, the head of all the, the troops that were going in to help or? Yes, all of the federal troops. Okay. Uh, because we had National Guard already here uh, in the state of Louisiana and in Mississippi. And the impact was uh, the Louisiana Combat Brigade, the Tiger Brigade, the 256, was in Iraq okay. at the time Katrina hit. So the, the biggest, most effective unit in that state National Guard was uh, patrolling in Iraq. And the reason I know my son, was my oldest son was with him. He was a part of that unit. Uh, and then the Mississippi, the 155 Mississippi Rifles, uh, they were in Iraq also. So the two hardest hit state were missing their number one response force, the, the combat brigades that would have the most experience and the most equipment to be able to respond were out of the state. And when a Katrina hit on the 29th and the levees broke, uh, the following hours, uh, we knew we were in trouble when the media showed the city of New Orleans underwater. And by Tuesday morning, I made my way to Camp Shelby, Mississippi, where I had 3,000 troops from the Wisconsin National Guard training to go to Iraq. And we were taking them through their maneuver phase and uh, arrived at uh, Camp Shelby, which is near Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and uh, very historical place uh, used in World War One and World War Two to train soldiers to go overseas to fight big wars. And uh, that Tuesday afternoon, I met the governor and the adjutant general of the state of Mississippi, and they took me up in a helicopter ride and I saw Biloxi and I called back to my boss and I told him Biloxi was destroyed. And the Admiral said, General, what do you mean it's destroyed? I said, it's destroyed. As in the word we use, destroyed in the military parlance is, is a word. <laughs> it's just nothing left, it's destroyed. It's uninhabitable. Uh, and the infrastructure is gone. There's no people there, it's gone. He said, okay, I got it. And he set that report up to when I assumed the Pentagon then, and they knew I was in Mississippi. And that night I got assigned as the Joint Task Force Katrina Command. And all the Joint Task Force mean is all the troops, federal troops coming into that area dealing with that storm would be under my command. Ships, airplanes, you name it, uh, in terms of federal troops. Because we have a unique role we play inside the states when we provide military support to civil authorities in that we are subordinate when we work through the Department of Defense, but the senior elected person in that state, which is the governor, and is in as a city, the mayor, are in charge. Our presence as federal troops do not uh, supersede the authority and the wishes of the governor or the senior elected official in the town. And I hope that's not too confusing. If it is, we can uh, we can pull it apart. And that's how I ended up as a Joint Task Force crew, Commander of Katrina. Okay. Um, so when, when you go into a hurricane or like, like that, you know, you've got 3,000 troops uh, w with you, and New Orleans is pretty much destroyed. Biloxi uh, was wiped out. What are, what are the first things that you, the first decisions that you have to make um as rapidly as possible. You got to get there. You got to get there. Yeah. It goes back to that point we made earlier. That being said, the 3,000 troops I had at Camp Shelby 
I left him there to clean up Camp Shelby because tornadoes had gone through it. And Camp Shelby would be a major logistics hub for the state of Mississippi. So their task was to stop training, take, clean all the roads up, get the electricity back on, get the water running, get the power on, working. And that's that, that was their job. I moved on to New Orleans uh, by way of a Navy helicopter from the USS Baton that had been transiting the Gulf and had been given to me as my first ship. We ended up with 20 ships in Joint Task Force Katrina and over 225 helicopters and 20,000 federal troops uh, and a nameless number of uh, C-130, C-17s, and uh, C-5 uh, cargo planes uh, in doing those uh, first 10 days. So uh, you said, what is your first mission? thing is to find out and define your mission. Uh, in our role as federal troops, is to save lives. That's the number one thing. And uh, you're going with that open mind. I flew into New Orleans on Wednesday morning on a Navy Seahawk helicopter. We made one turn around the Superdome, which was surrounded. Those people remember that picture with people standing outside. And as that helicopter came in, it's somewhat of a dramatic landing. <laughs> yeah. As we came down, the, the rotors on that Seahawk was hitting small limbs on the trees. But this was not a mission where you we want to take some risks to get in there. There were already helicopters there, but the spot that was open uh, was that spot that tipped off some uh, small limbs off the of trees. But that spoke to the seriousness of the mission. We had something to do, and the pilots knew what they were doing. They had confidence in the machine, and uh, – we did a little tree trimming that morning going in. <laughs> uh, but again, that's something you would not already do in ordinary circumstances, if you understand what I'm saying. Of course, of course. And walked in, and there was the mayor of New Orleans in a meeting with the National Guard general that was assigned with him at the Superdome, as well as a gentleman from FEMA. And uh, the mayor said... Uh, my number one priority is to get the city evacuated. Okay, I just heard a mission, evacuated. Provide food and water for the people and medicine. Okay, I got that. And uh, by then, FEMA and the National Guard were working on buses to come in uh, to pick the people up. And just a quick recount that Wednesday, I left there and went to see the governor of Louisiana. And when I walked in that Wednesday afternoon, I said, uh, I asked the governor uh, if there was anything specific. She said, and she almost repeated, evacuate the city of New Orleans. I'd like for you to lead that general. I said, okay. And provide food and water to the people. And a big challenge she had was she and the mayor couldn't speak. And there was two reasons they couldn't speak. They had a god-awful personal relationship because when the governor ran for governorship, the mayor supported an opponent, <laughs> and that's never good. You know, politicians have a way to act like they don't forget, and they didn't. It was a contentious relationship throughout. So it wasn't just that the phone lines were down, it's that the relationship was strained. And uh, it didn't take long to get a sense of that. So uh, after the governor... He gave me her priorities, and she said, tell the president, send everything he's got. And again, for the rule of warfare, you got to get there. If you want me to evacuate, and we didn't know the number at that time, 70,000 people out of New Orleans, uh, I don't need to bring 80,000 federal troops to do that. Because <laughs> if, if I got to bring them in first, it's going to delay the evacuation. And sometimes it goes back to a lesson that uh, I heard many senior officers repeat to us sometime, as was in the case of Patton, you don't necessarily give him what he asked for, you give him what he need. You don't actually give him what they want, you give him what they need. And that really made him successful. In this case, the governor wanted as many troops as we could send, 
quoting her, but I knew this was a language that uh, emotionally that's what she wanted, but the first priority was to get the people out of the city. And, and if we went through a long deployment of 60 to 70,000 troops down there, it, it would delay getting people who's been standing outside for seven days. So I heard that and put it in the back of my mind and we went back to the city. And it, as it worked out, it took two or three days for her and the president to decide how many federal troops uh, and then who they were going to work for, all that normal state and federal friction that's there. And uh, we worked out a plan with the National Guard how we would start evacuating people uh, from the Superdome. And in the interim, I asked her to mobilize uh, school buses inside the state. And the school buses were delivered. And because of uh, the perception that New Orleans was dangerous and, and the, the parishes brought the buses, but they didn't leave drivers. So we had to find drivers. So the National Guard had to find drivers. And again, a lot of the perception was I mean, that, that New Orleans is a dangerous place. And if you look at Louisiana, probably 70% of the drivers are women. It's the second, it's the second job or a primary job for many moms and grandmoms who drive buses in these rural communities. So we got the buses, then the next thing was to get the people out of the city and the state of Texas was most accommodating. And uh, they said, send them there and they had the accommodation. And we flew them out. The next couple of days, people drove out by bus. And then by Saturday, we had airplanes available and we were able to fly them out of the city of New Orleans. And I, and that's how we kind of rolled in that. But you have to figure out what the priorities are. You have to listen very keenly uh, to what the leaders say they want and then what is needed to accomplish that as opposed to uh, using every word verbatim as what is the mission. Absolutely. Um, now, on leadership, uh, we know you have a, a book. You have a few books, but... Uh, you have a book on leadership specifically, talking about the new normal, and you address uh, three key, three essential lessons that you learned as a young man about leadership, and then added some more yourself. And um, I'm curious, and I'm, I'm sure you're going to overlap these, but can you tell us about uh, tell us a story about a time um, when when leadership uh, lessons of leadership most affected you and I think it might go back to uh, that's most vivid in my memory we, we go back to Katrina because that was my biggest challenge and the one that probably have us the reason why we set me to talk in the day otherwise I would be like most of my friends out on a golf course someplace or getting ready to go hunting quail or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the three pieces is a clear, number one, a definition of the, the, the business of leadership to build this to get people to willingly follow you to accomplish the task and the mission. Because if you don't willingly follow you, of course, as soon as you're gone, it would be too easy for people to modify, you know, those things that you think that need to be done to accomplish the task of mission. And the next, I guess, one learn, and I tell this story all the time, uh, something that I kind of learned from a teacher that he spoke to this concept of doing the routine things well. And uh, the story I use now is General Washington's army as a backdrop for that. And to use a metaphor uh, to tell that story of Washington winning our freedom from the British with his army. And the first thing he had to do was teach him to do the routine things well. And I tell folks, you know, how many of you spent time in the last five days uh, having to go back and rewrite a procedure or uh, had to expend some revenue because somebody failed to do the routine things well. Right. And how in our everyday lives with our children, 
that, you know, getting up in the morning and make your bed ought to be the first thing they ought to do when they learn how to walk. Uh, do the routine things well. Uh, and in the case of Washington and his army, you know, we tell them, don't put the horses upstream from the night camp. <laughs> it take a little time to figure that one out, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> the other one is uh, one that's been said eloquently by many people, uh, don't be afraid of the impossible. Mm-hmm. And uh, in that book that's amplified leadership in the new normal, I think when we look where we sit in history, uh, the things we have to deal with, like climate change, uh, available clean drinking water, uh, will require us to do the impossible. And I encourage leaders in the, these leader seminars that I speak in and disaster preparedness seminars is that we need to create a list of impossible. Because there you will find the things that will drive the future economy and our survival as as a country and as a, a global people. We're going to have to do things we hadn't done before. And as in the case of Washington, uh, on the 25th of, of uh, 1775, he's sitting there. The, the capital of New York had been burned. The one in uh, Philadelphia is threatened. And it's Christmas Day, and he tell the boys they're going to attack. Not all of the soldiers are well trained. They don't have the right equipment. But he believed that this concept, uh, if it's important to do, we're going to have to do things that most people think are impossible. But again, all the opportunities on the other side are impossible. And on a cold night, without boats, they borrowed boats, they crossed the river, and they killed or captured nearly a 1,000 British troops keeping that uh, war going for another six years. But that was significant to get what many would have said would be an impossible battle to win. And the third lesson I'm learning from uh, teachers that and it's applied to uh, this story of Washington uh, as a backdrop is that if you're going to lead, you've got to be prepared to accept criticism because people will criticize you mostly because of change, things you want to change. And people don't like change. Right. Very but true. we know, we all know if you're not changing, you're falling behind. I mean, this is just a temple of how the world works. And after Washington that won the, the Revolutionary War, where the examples came back, he was told uh, by some northern folks in one of these small uh, states up there, he would, George, we're not paying taxes. And this is where classic Washington, he looks around to his aide and, and he said, saddle up Nelson. Because Nelson was the actual name of his white horse. Give me 2,500 troops. We march in north. Is that he was decisive. As of the day, he didn't send an email or send a tweet. <laughs> he said, saddle a horse up. We're going up there. Uh, and it was very clear, decisive. What is that point? Because when you're creating change, you have to have a, a clear understanding that people are going to fight you and they don't want to do it, but you're going to have to lead them. And you're going to have to accept that criticism, but at the same time, go lead them to where you want to go. So again, a roll up of those three points is do the routine things well. Don't be afraid of the impossible. I tell CEOs, you ought to have an impossible list. You know, there'll be people that say, you know, our way forward out of the pollution that we have is all electric cars, whatever it is. All it's going to be, we've got to clean up water. We've got to go change all the plumbing pipes. Whatever it is, those things that seem impossible we must do because we can't continue to have cities if you use the current examples like flint and over in new jersey fail and our children are drinking lead water if it takes changing the pipes go change them let's get it done because of the impact on the future of the health of our people Uh, so create that impossible list because there will be somebody out there who can solve that problem. 
And that's how we've continued to evolve as a nation from looking at and understanding history in some of our darkest hours well, we had to overcome things. And much of that is uh, creating uh, solutions to things that most people say are impossible. So I think that's a, a model. It works for me. It steadies me. And I got to figure out where I'm in that cycle. If something's not going, have I been doing the routine correctly? No. I gained a little weight. Have I been going to the gym like I should? No. <laughs> I literally lose 10 pounds. That's looked impossible at my age 72, but you got to do it. I mean, whatever that case is, that that little work through has worked for me and in retrospect, many successful leaders that I've studied. What type of routine on the subject, what type of routine do you keep on a, on a regular basis? Well, uh, I stay pretty much in a loop on what's happening in the world uh, before I go to bed and when I get up in the morning. And that's mostly out of routine. <laughs> of, uh, I haven't done it when I was on active duty, but I think being aware of current events is, is, is very important to what I do, which is speak nationally and consult uh, globally sometime. Uh, the other one is, is keep myself in some decent form of physical shape. And knowing that includes going to the gym in the morning and working out for about 35, 40 minutes on a bike, doing a few weights, then getting out of there before, and then go see about my horse. I do have a riding horse. He's about oh, you do? Okay. two miles from my house, yeah. And I go there twice a day. When I'm in town, once in the morning, see how things going. Then once in the evening, to go give him his night feed and uh, just do that as a routine. I think getting out the house and and breaking that up with that, because that's a very peaceful time with me when I spend it with the horse. I know some people use golf or other things to relax, but that's my space. I hate golf. Uh, but I like fooling around with my horse <laughs> and working in my yard. I prefer riding a horse over golf too. <laughs> a lot of people wouldn't, but, uh, I just, I would. Yeah. Um, who are, we've talked, you've touched on, you know, General Washington and, and some other leaders, um, living or dead, who are some of the, uh, the leaders that you really admire and look up to? Well, yeah, going back in our own history, I think Washington was significant. Uh, I think uh, MacArthur, General MacArthur, General Bradley was significant, General Pershing from World War One. I'm, I'm not saying them in order, but you, you've got that. Uh, I think they all were significant. I think Troy is uh, inspirational uh, people on a political warfare. I think Churchill was was masterful at the language and the foresight to see how things should be. And I think uh, President Kennedy's skill uh, and passion uh, to deliver a message was powerful. And the man at the time, uh, Dr. King, uh, and Gandhi showed us a different path to resolve our issues without going to war. Uh, I think they were significant. And I think uh, among ladies, the, the courage and acceptance of uh, Mother Teresa was profound, that there was something inspirational by the path she took that would make you lay pause to think the humanity she di displayed was just uh, remarkable. Her ability to draw from kings to queens to popes and 
generals got drawn into that spirit uh, of what she showed for the humanity, for humans, for people, for the less fortunate, for the poor and the sick. So I think there's much to be learned from her presence in and I think all through my lifetime, I think Margaret Thatcher played a significant role as a lady politician and, and world leader. As far as influencers, when we look at how uh, influence and helping uh, in the Cold War as we knew it, you know, the U.S. took the lead. We just outspent the Russians, the Soviet Union, uh, but she had a significant role in that. Yeah. Very true. Um, now, I, I'm always curious how the world sees leaders, influencers, and heroes and heroines in one way. Um, but one thing that I don't think we talk enough about with these leaders is the, how they per perceive themselves. And uh, and I know you mentioned the importance of change. So I'm curious if you if we could uh, you could take us inside your mind and tell us how you perceive yourself in the importance of flexibility and change in that role. Yeah, um, I think uh, is to have a good appreciation of what you're not good at. <laughs> right, that's good, and to be aware of it for sure. And, 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 and don't try to act like you have overcome it because you probably have. <laughs> so, um, like, I would never try to solve a math problem in public. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I would, uh, when I write on a chalkboard or at a lecture thing, I always scribble it out to me all the E's and I's kind of look alike because they, I don't spell well. And I have a tendency to use adult language. And uh, that's a weakness. And uh, it can be a bad habit. So I've learned to use that weapon only for emphasis and to not say anything in public that you don't see on TV, which is a pretty low bar these days. But Nothing I wouldn't want my grandkids to hear. So I think those kind of keep you in balance. And as you get older, you know, you got security, uh, retired from the army. I don't have to work anymore. I got, so I got financial security. Uh, I think it, it gives you a, a sense of, and you don't have to get up and go work every day though although i get up and i wouldn't do want to do anything else and find something to do but i'm not ready to join that club that the only thing i do between breakfast is lunch is figure out where i'm going to lunch hell no i ain't ready to join that club and i hope i'll never be in that club there's too much to do when we look at the challenges we have today uh it going from seven to ten billion people in the world chris it, it, it gives me chill and fever when we look at the having to produce 40% more food in the coming 50 years. That right now we're the third largest population in the world in terms of countries behind China and India. And each one of them have a billion more people than we do. And in another 20 years, probably Nigeria is going to be bigger than the United States and they'll be the third largest population. And when you look at of the 7 billion people in the world today, the challenges we have with food security, water security, where you look at water as a commodity or you look at it as a privilege or you look at it as an opportunity, but only 1% of the world's water is drinkable. And you know what we do to that other 99%? We flush out tarlin in it. We do industry work with it. You name it. Pigs, uh, residue, and cows, and runoff from agriculture. We just wreak havoc, plastic, garbage in the oceans. 
uh, there's much work left to be done. And those are the things, challenges that inspire me to use my, the time I have to work awareness that we're going to have to, uh, the new economy is going to be how we survive going from seven to 10 billion people uh, because of the impact of what we're doing with pollution. And the inequity in the system where of the 7 billion people in the world a day, about 2 billion don't have clean water in their homes. And much of the day of the women in those households is going out and gathering water, clean water. And the fact that they don't have electricity as we know it, uh, nearly 2 of the 7 billion people. And we are moving toward 10 billion people, so maybe adding more people to this line of have-nots. And I think that is going to create significant enough friction that we'll have to continue to spend an enormous amount of our uh, nation's wealth on what we call national defense, where I think we need to be focusing on solving some of these enduring problems like food security, water security, and ability for people to have a uh, confidence of the goodness of of uh, what electricity or some other form of power brings us so they can have a television, so they can have a computer that would make them profitable in terms of uh, being consumers when we add those other 2 billion people to the, to the world of consumerism because uh, they have uh, some form of power. And I used to say electricity because I don't think the future form of power will likely be electricity as we know it, but it'll be some form of power that could come in a little box that arrives at your front door or delivered to you by a drone. But in that box, if your power go out, it run your house for two months. And if you think about it, you can make it to last for two months, you can make it to last for 10 years. That there will be people in the future that will have electricity the source of some source of electricity that won't have a power line running to the house. That is, that is the economy we got to go toward because everybody needs to have the ability to communicate, to save their food, save their medicine, and to deal with the extreme heat we're dealing with. And that is the kind of solutions we've got to find because the pollution we have created is challenging the earth in terms of available land to raise crops on and the severe weather patterns we have coming in. Uh, and much of that has to do with the pollution we've created. So it brings forth great opportunities for people who are going to be uh, accelerating in leadership and businesses to say how do we prepare the world from going from seven to 10 billion. And I think that economy is gonna be driven by solutions to water and clean air and food security, as well as cyber security and some of these other things that face us. And finding solutions to that is uh, gonna drive the future economy. Yeah, absolutely. On on that subject, we know you're a proponent of climate change and uh, or fixing climate change, environmentalism. And uh, um, what's your outtake on on some of the things that we should be doing, not only as a country but as a world, um, to help fight climate change and correct it, and also some of the things that just local common folks. Uh, can do on a regular basis to to help make a shift, uh, significant impact, and and making sure things don't get worse. Well, you know, uh, for the sake of our people in the industry today, I'll start out with the common folks like you and I can do. Okay, okay. We divest ourselves of plastic. You know, you look like you're old enough, and I'm old enough. When I went to school, they gave us a milk carton, and you drank out the milk carton. Then somebody said, "Oh, we got a straw for you." <laughs> and I can remember those early straws you would, I mean, when I came in the army, you'd punch it in the side of the, and that thing had to be strong enough. Yeah. Or you could stab somebody with that if you would. <laughs> and 
what in the hell were we thinking about? Because we didn't have a recycle program for them, and who would know how long that thing would last and how everybody got excited and you would go to the pop stand or to a drive-in and they would give you a big old white cup made out of styrofoam. And they would tell you, you know, it would keep your drink cool for you while you drove in the car. But how stupid we were. That We think that stuff will last over 100 years. And there's, and there's nothing we can do with it, styrofoam. And we used to put our food in it. In some places you go here in Baton Rouge, not all they have is styrofoam cups and styrofoam takeout plates, if you know what I mean. How stupid were we were? I mean, this is just, it doesn't make sense. And then the evolution of the plastic bag. I mean, we will look back, and that would be probably one of the dumbest decisions we <laughs> ever made. Right. I mean, how ass backward could we be to buy, and then we made the plastic bag, and we said it's stronger than paper. And they kept making them stronger. I mean, you come out, you can go buy a $100 grocery and put it in two plastic bags. Right, Let's right. Say it's the two, and you take that thing home, and you're trying to tear it open. You can't tear it open, which means God knows where it's going to end up. The guys at the dump don't want them because there's not an easy way to dispose of them. What in the hell are we thinking about when we invented this god-awful thing? And now everywhere you see these plastic, hard plastic forks. Uh, what were we thinking about? And the uh, the plastic cups. You go to parades now and people come out and they buy these colored cups. I don't want to use a brand. I don't want to piss nobody off. But, you know, they, they become a symbol and really big, they throw them on the ground. I think those things looking back on we got it all wrong but the good news is the group of leaders we got coming up we got a chance to get it right and that into itself those solutions will help drive the economy but i think we got plastics all wrong and they're ending up in our food and our seafood in the ocean that because it was so relatively available and we could ship it anywhere and people could transform it into bumpers for cars or cases for telephones. We kept, we allowed it to slip into our food chain and to every consumer to every day adding something to climate change by the amount of plastic we use. That, that was a big one. and. I think we missed the opportunity going back 10 years to be further down the road on sustainable energy. Uh, but we're going through a phase that we went through. I think to change, to adapt to climate change is going to cause us to do a cultural change, Chris. And I tell folks that when we're going to adapt, we'll get a cultural shift. And we've seen in our lifetime two of them that we know. The first cultural shift came forward to me was watching what happened with cigarettes. When I was growing up, if you sat on our porch, uh, everybody was smoking, except my mom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> everybody who got old enough in my family had their pack of cigarettes in their brand. And we had this, this thing consumed us. We had the Marlboro Man. That guy was the coolest cowboy. I mean, he was a good-looking guy. He had a great-looking horse. And he'd come up, and he'd ride off, and, man, I want to get some Marlboro. Oh, the cool lady on television, you know, those great old actresses. And and he would pull that smoke out and Beauregard and them. You know, I mean, we were consumed with this concept of cigarettes. And the Surgeon General said, it's going to kill you. It's killing you. And what happened? We saw a group of public messages. It got related directly to our health. It was a personal decision. It's something you didn't have to do. If you don't start, the best thing you do is don't start. That it was classified as a drug, as habit forming. And 
by the time I left the army, I was the only one in my army headquarters that smoked cigars. Only one. And when I came in the army, all through Everybody. those years, there were less and less people smoking because the awareness that we had brought forth, we made a cultural shift. The other cultural shift I saw us make as a not just as a nation, but was with AIDS. We got it into the education. It was public message. I remember being a major in uh, Germany and our daughter was about nine years old, oldest daughter, she came home and she said, Dad, I've got this paper here from the teacher. We have to sit down and talk about AIDS. And I almost flipped out. What in the world are they teaching this nine-year-old child about AIDS for? But you know what? That created the cultural shift. Then they made movies about it. I mean, some real tear-jerker movies. Hollywood got involved. So we look at those two things that cause us to do that cultural shift. Because in both cases, people were dying. And we, we could make that connection. There is still a reluctance of us in this. Those are in power, those that influence power. I say climate change is causing people to die. And we have not openly made that connection, but it is happening. It is happening as we speak that I firmly believe, if I understand the history of what happened in Syria, it started off as a case of two tribes arguing over water. It became a religious dispute because different religious sects were involved. You know the rest, country civil war, thousands of its people are having to evacuate because of the brutal war. It started over water. And it's not the first and it's not gonna be the last. I think we're gonna to have to come to grips and create a cultural shift, not only in America, but globally, to be able to address with the issues of climate change. Because it's gonna take everybody that's gonna to have to be involved. And it's gonna create great business opportunities and create new jobs as we switch to sustainable energy. And there'll be a while we'll still have to use fossil energy, but I think there is a given exploration date on fossil fuel. I mean, our friends, the Saudis, have dealt with them over the years. There's an expiration date on how much fuel oil they have left, and they know it. And they're trying to transition the economy to 30, 40 years from now when they no longer have that natural resource to be able to run the country with. And we're going to have to come to grips with that in America. When do you think that expiration date might be? Just a rough estimate. Curious. Well, I think it's beyond my lifetime. Uh, but it's going to have to happen in the next 20 to 30 years, I think. Because, you know, the polar ice cap is melting. We got rising sea levels down in Miami and in Louisiana. We're having to move uh, a native uh indigenous tribe out of South Louisiana because their homes are now underwater from a combination of rising sea levels and saltwater intrusion that was created by the oil and gas business. So much of this is related back to what we have done and continue to do uh, in the atmosphere and on the ground that we're having to move this community. And it's just the beginning for Louisiana because I think more and more communities along the coast are going to have to move north of Interstate 10. And when we look at the weather patterns of like what happened in Hurricane Harvey down in Texas, where you get over 40 inches of rain, and you look up and you figure out, oh, boy, they built the city of Houston in the flood zone. Well, no kidding, they sure did. <laughs> uh, and the fact that we have the 100-year flood two or three times a year. And we have the 500 year flood about every year, somewhere in America, that this is a result of climate change. And climate change is a result of things that we put in the air and we put into the sea that's uh, attributing to more massive hurricanes because the sea is warmer. 
as the hurricanes come in, we don't have as much coast to protect us from them. And the amount of heat that builds up is transforming into these microbursts, uh, weather, water events that uh, create a significant amount of flooding, not only in America, but globally. And at the same time, has created vast expanses of Africa uh, into uh, dust bowls because the impact of the extreme heat. General, I, I got a question. Um, I'm a, a avid reader, and I know leaders are readers. What would you say are three of your your favorite books, and why? Oh. Again, my weak point is remembering stuff like that. Uh, <laughs> but I, I do like that book, going back to the ancient history, uh, The Art of War by Sun Tzu. It was redone by many. Very, very keen tactical lessons in there that even apply today. But he had a keen way of of communicating with his warriors and as well as demonstrating his own proudness by outthinking them. So I think that that auto war is, and the lessons in there are significant. There's a book written a few years ago, I'm gonna describe it to you. I think it's McCollum. It's a, uh, it tells the repeated stories of successful people, uh, turning point, Oh, tipping point. Tipping point. Tipping point. Yeah, by Malcolm Gladwell. I think that's a hell of a book. It's a good book. Because I mean, to tell every kid you read this, you know, and you take your strengths and you repetitively do it, and you can be a Nobel Prize winner. I mean, I think that is very illustrative, and I. Um, sent copies of those to my grandson. But I think that's a significant uh, piece of work. And I think, uh, again, that's why I stay away from my weaknesses, remembering Freeman, the book, The World's Flat. Yeah. I think that's a pretty illustrative piece of work that remind us that we're connected, you know. Uh, right now, the oil refinery in Saudi Arabia is burning, and most people didn't spend two minutes, they don't even know about it. But in two days, that's going to affect the price of gas around the world. And physically, it may not, we may not have to do that, but the market will do anything to raise the price of something. <laughs> Is there sufficient supply, I think, in the chain? But something happening, it, it reminds us of this concept he, he uh, gave is that we're interconnected. And I think the other thing is something I saw on television. Uh, over the last year, uh, there was a lady trying to work her way through Mexico from the triangle down there into the United States. And one of the reporters said, well, you're trying to go to the United States and they've, uh, it's going to be very tough that, you know, you might lose your children when you get there and, you, and it's against the law for you to do what you're doing. And she looked passionately at that report and she said, I think God told me to get my children to a safer place. And boy, when she repeated that, because to me, the laws we have are for us, <laughs> And for other people to follow when they come to us, but it's all made up stuff we made up along the way, right? So this lady said, 
they can separate me from my children, but I want them to have a better life. And in essence, this border don't mean nothing to me. You know what I mean? It means something to us. That she was willing to give her children up so they could have a better life. That's some powerful shit right there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Very true. I mean, we can set up on our televisions and have all the eloquent talking heads go on all the 24-hour TV and talk about the laws and stuff. But, you know, those are laws of man. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> uh, uh, when she said, I'm, I'm willing for them to take them from me so they can have a better life. I mean, I don't think there's a lot of people, you know, well, I shouldn't judge other people, but I thought that was a very powerful statement. And to speak to the, that our borders historically are very temporary, you know, when you look at it across history, and the fact that they are what they are today have changed significantly in written history. And the fact that people want a better life for their children, you can't quantify that because we wrote a law some time ago and said you can't come here because they're going to go someplace if they can keep their children alive and to have a better life for them. And I just thought that was a very powerful little clip that remind us that we could end up with a million person or two million people migrating from South America at any given time. Very true. Now they might want to just go through here and go to Canada because life is a little better than that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Other than happen. the weather. Yeah. <laughs> it could happen. I mean, it's true. Because to us, those borders mean something. The people who want food security, water security, and have a safe community to live in, uh, the border don't mean nothing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's an incredible leadership decision like that woman was making, you know, because no great change comes without leadership and sacrifice. You know, leaderships or leaders are not afraid to take on the impossible. And that's exactly what that woman was doing. Let's talk about that last point there, because I know I'm probably over my time. But I think this point, you kind of remind me again, I didn't write my notes out, but this business is sacrifice. Is that if you're going to lead, you have to be prepared to sacrifice. Uh, I think, and it's going to cost you if you're going to make a difference. You got to be able to, because leadership is not a popularity contest. It's about performance. And the sacrifice that people make to cause change, to make a difference. And there will be people say, when I'm leading, I'm not sacrificing anything. I pay my fly, I play golf twice a week, and you know, uh, I go to church for five hours on Sunday, and you know, I do about, well, if you're not sacrificing, you might be doing some form of management, but you're not leading. Because leadership's gonna, cause you to challenge the system and it's going to cause you to sacrifice because that's what we've got to do to create change. And I remind those business folks I talk to is if you're not sacrificing, you're not leading. You might be doing some form of management and your life might be Okadora. You got the big house. You got beautiful kids. You all want to write school. Uh, you got a nice job. You feel comfortable. But if you're not sacrificing, enjoy the ride because you're not leading. You do some bullshit form of management, but you're not leading. Because people who are leading are forced to sacrifice not only their time, they're forced to sacrifice even their time with their family and the things that they like to do in order to create the change that's needed. And again, because if you're not sacrificing, I don't think you're leading. Yeah, well put, well put. General, we're going to wrap up there. I want to thank you so much for your time. Um, first, before we wrap, off, wrap up, um, if the listeners out there want to learn more about what you have going on and more about you, where's the best place they can do that at? 
I have a lot a website, and you can just put my name is Russell Honore, and it'll pop up on the Google. Is one of them, but in any major uh, search engines. But Google, uh, I have an ad there from my website that described the three books I've written, Survival, How Creating a Culture of Preparedness to Save You and Your Family. And the second book, Leadership in the New Normal, which we spent a little bit talking about. And then my last book, Don't Get Stuck on Stupid, which <laughs> is <love> that. <laughs> a flavor of if we keep doing the same thing, we will continue to get the same results. So let's not get stuck on stupid. <laughs> and that's my newest book. Great title. Okay, General, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing all your tips and, and wisdom with us and your stories. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for what you do. Bye. And listeners, we're going to wrap up there. Thank you guys for tuning in once again, and we'll see you all in the next episode. Goodbye, everybody. Hey listeners, thanks for joining us once again. We wanted to remind you about our high performance productivity coaching and our five, six, seven, and eight figure private masterminds. These are all designed for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs to help you scale rapidly and grow. Check out all the details at thebusinessmethod.com. That's thebusinessmethod.com. And we'll see you all on the next episode.